So last time we just saw, you know, how the myosin heads attached and they pulled and I said they pulled the actin together and so, you know, the sarcomere shortened, the Z discs approached each other, the I bands shortened, but the A bands remained the same, right? So now here we are going to look at it in a little bit more detail. So we're really doing this in steps. So we're looking at it in a little bit more detail. You remember earlier we talked about uh, terminal cisterny, uh, which were parts of the dilated parts of the um, endo uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum. Uh, and, you know, they stored, their function was to store calcium and release it when it's needed. So now we are going to actually see how that calcium plays a role here in the contraction of muscle. So we're kind of bringing that into play, okay? Uh, one of the ways I kind of uh, was telling some people how to remember, how do you remember what is T-tubules and what is terminal cisterny, what is their function? They're both kind of similar, beginning with a T. So the way I kind of told them is that, you know, in the toilet, the tank that you have, another word for the tank is cistern. Cistern is something dilated, big, some reservoir. So think of it that way. So terminal cistern is like a tank. So it's something big and dilated. It's part of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And since it's a tank, it stores something. So it stores calcium and releases it when needed. T-tubule, on the other hand, was part of the sarcolemma. It was an invagination of the sarcolemma. So that is, so you know, that's the way you're going to remember it, okay? So here now let's look at this, how that calcium plays a role. So what happens is that if you remember when we talked of actin filaments and myosin filaments, we said there were some parts, uh, actin had three parts to it. You know, it was made of G-actin. It was also made of tropomyosin, which is this yellow line, and that was, you know, blocking all the active sites where that myosin could attach. And then it had another thing which was called troponin, which was this yellow colored, these balls here, and that attached to actin. And what it did, did was it rotated this actin filament in such a way that the active sites were shown, uh, you know, they were unblocked and the myosin head could attach. So now we're going to look at all of that. So let's look at this place here. So here we have this myosin filament and it's this is the myosin head and let's say it has got ATP. It's got ATP is present in the cytoplasm so it's got ATP and it kind of breaks the ATP into ADP and phosphate so it's kind of gotten energized and at the same time calcium is released from the terminal cisterny. In a little while we'll see how, what makes calcium be released from the cisterny. For now, just think of it that calcium is also released from the terminal cisterny. It binds to this troponin uh, part of the actin filament. So that undergoes a change and the active sites are shown. So now this energized myosin attaches to the active sites on actin and it pulls it. So you can see as the head is cocking this way, it's pulling the actin filament towards the center. So this happens at either end. Can you see that? When it pulls it towards the center at that, at that point, after that, it detaches. So you can see that it is detaching. It again has to attach to another ATP molecule so that it can again hydrolyze that ATP and break it into ATP and ADP. And then again, here you can see it has detached and again, it will kind of attach again. So that's why you have the attachment and detachment, attachment and detachment. And this will keep going on as long as ATP is present and as long as calcium is present. Okay? Do you understand? This is how it happens. And just to see this, let's look at this video. <clears throat> Biochemical details of cross-linking and sliding in the actin filaments by the myosin heads. The cycle starts when an electrical impulse from a motor neuron stimulates a muscle fiber. Invertebrate animals may have one, two, or three motor neurons that control the contraction of a single muscle fiber, and each motor neuron has multiple in-plate junctions spread over the fiber surface. The nerve signal from a motor neuron does not generate an action potential in an invertebrate muscle fiber, but rather depolarizes the entire surface of the fiber to produce contraction. 
The electrical depolarization also spreads into tiny membranous invaginations of the fiber membrane called transverse tubules or T-tubules. The T-tubules extend to the myofibrils. The T-tubules align with the A-band in invertebrate muscles. The T-tubules essentially carry the electrical signal into the sarcoplasm and along the sarcoplasmic reticulum, a complex of membranous vesicles that serve to store calcium within the muscle. Depolarization of the T-tubule membrane activates calcium release channels of the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release stored calcium into the sarcoplasm. calcium then initiates the muscle contraction by binding to a protein called troponin. Calcium activated troponin causes a conformational shift in the protein tropomyosin which winds around the actin helix and blocks the myosin binding sites on the actin molecules. This frees the actin molecules to bind the myosin head units. The contraction cycle starts with the myosin head bound to adenosine triphosphate, ATP. The myosin head contains adenosine triphosphatase, an enzyme that splits the high-energy phosphate bond of ATP to produce adenosine diphosphate, ADP, and inorganic phosphate. The resulting ADP and inorganic phosphate remain associated with the myosin head, which is also charged with the energy released by the splitting of the high-energy phosphate from the ADP. To start the contraction cycle, the myosin head attaches loosely to actin, then releases the inorganic phosphate, which causes tight binding with the actin. After tight binding, proteins in the myosin head undergo a conformational change that results in repositioning the angle of attachment between the myosin head and the actin. The shift to the new conformation pulls the actin along the myosin. After pulling the actin, myosin exchanges a DP for a new molecule of ATP. This results in release of the myosin head from the actin. The myosin head resumes its relaxed conformation and position, and the cycle is ready to repeat. Let us watch the cycle repeat several times. Here you saw how it was needed and how it attacked it, it hydrolyzed it and pulled it and then you get another ATP molecule when it detached and again it hydrolyzed and so it keeps pulling. So as long as ATP and calcium are available, the muscle will keep on contracting, okay? So let's do a little bit of a review. What are T-tubules? Okay, very good. Invaginations of sarcolemma. And I know I said this earlier, so you hopefully remembered it from there. Another way to kind of look at it, and it just struck me, is uh, if we go back to... And if you look at this picture here, and if you... The T-tubule is like a tube, and you can see here... So here's the tube, here's the T-tubule, this one. So it's like a tube, and if you think of it, it's kind of arranged like a T. So, okay, so that's how you're going to remember it, T-tubule. And this is the sarcolemma which has gone in and formed that T. Okay, so that's the way you're going to remember it.
Okay, what is the role of calcium in muscle contraction? Well, half the class got it right. Yes, it is to remove the blocking action of tropomyosin. ATP is not provided by calcium. You will see later. ATP comes from some like glucose or creatine phosphate or something like that which is present inside the cell. Calcium is not able to give you ATP. And if you remember when we did chemistry, we talked of ATP. Right? This ATP comes from glucose or even fats or, or proteins can provide ATP. Um, and it doesn't, it's not something which allows the myosin heads to detach. The myosin heads detach when they attach to, after having hydrolyzed and, you know, formed ADP and they attach first. Then they uh, attach to another molecule of ATP, they detach, then they will hydrolyze it, they get energized, and then they attach again, okay? So it, the detachment is because of myosin having another ATP molecule attached to it. So, so far, what we've been doing is we're looking at muscle fibers and we talked of how, you know, the, the myosin heads attached to the actin filament and they pulled it to the center. Mm -hmm. And if you paid attention to the video, which I just showed you on the, how the myosin head attached to the actin filament, in the beginning, he talked a little bit about a nerve impulse and he called, talked something about depolarization and so on. So here is, it's all fine that we, we know that the sliding occurs and the muscle fiber contracts and because the muscle fiber contracts, the whole muscle contracts and that is because of the uh, myosin heads binding to actin and pulling it towards the center. But what actually causes that sliding to occur? So that's the question we are asking here. So what is it that is actually causing the sliding to even begin? That is because of, and this is, if we go back right to the beginning, remember we said that skeletal muscle was innervated or the nerve supply of skeletal muscle was through the somatic nervous system. The nerve supply of uh, cardiac and smooth muscle was through the autonomic nervous system. So there must have been a reason why I mentioned nerve supply. So here is what it is. It is because of the nerve supply and through the nerve, the arrival of a nerve impulse that actually comes and stimulates and brings about this whole action. So what happens is that the a nerve impulse comes and it stimulates the nerve fiber. And how this happens is that we will see as we go on, there are certain steps. The membrane, the surface of the sarcolemma has what is known as a resting membrane potential. So the surface of the sarcolemma, and don't worry, we'll see this. It's the surface of the sarcolemma has something known as a resting membrane potential. So what is this resting membrane potential? So if you look at a, a muscle fiber, so this is a muscle fiber, here are all the nuclei. We will find that outside the muscle fiber, we are going to look at this, if there is a slide for this, so just watch here, don't draw. There, there are more sodium ions on the outside and inside the muscle cell, that means in the cy cytoplasm or sarcoplasm, there are more potassium ions. However, there is more sodium outside than there is potassium inside. So we say that the inside is less positive compared to the outside. Okay, that's the norm. So that is what is known as the resting membrane potential. So that means there's a voltage difference between the outside and the inside. The outside being more positive compared to the inside or the inside being less positive compared to the outside, okay? Now, when this nerve impulse arrives, what it does is it kind of disturbs that equilibrium. And that disturbance is known as depolarization. We'll be looking at it and we'll see what happens. And when the, the cell membrane or the sarcolemma or the muscle cell membrane gets depolarized, it generates what is known as an action potential. 
So the nerve impulse then continues along the length of the sarcolemma. It then, because the sarcolemma has these T tubules, it will go and stimulate the T tubules as well. Then those T tubules cause calcium to be released from the terminal cisterny. And when that calcium gets released, then it binds to troponin and, you know, the sliding occurs, right? So this is the part which we saw so far. This is the part which we have seen so far, right? We saw calcium being released, binding to troponin, changing the, tropomy changing the actin filament um, structure so that the binding sites become open, they open or they become active and myosin can attach. This is the part we are going to look at right now. Okay, so this is the part we are going to look at and we are going, so here we talked of terminal cisterny which were releasing calcium. Here is where we will talk about these T tubules. So here is where we are going to see how the T tubules kind of help. So in order to see this, I am going to go back again to this slide and I want to make sure you look at this picture. Here. So coming back to this, so can you see this T tubule present here and on either side of the T tubule is this terminal cisterny. Can you see that? And that's why we called it a triad because it was one T tubule with a terminal cisterny on either side. So the, look at this relationship of the T tubule to the terminal cisterny. Okay. So therefore when the impulse comes along the sarcolemma, you can understand it will also go into this T tubule. And then it will stimulate these terminal cisterny to release their calcium ions and that's how the sliding begins, okay? So let's now first look at, so what we're going to look at just now is this portion, that is how the nerve impulse actually arrives and how it passes into the T-tubule. So when we say that the a muscle gets a nerve supply, we also talked very early, I talked of something known as motor units. If you remember, I mentioned something called a motor unit right at the beginning. So a motor unit was a single nerve fiber or a single axon or single nerve fiber. And the number of muscle fibers it supplies and the number of muscle fibers it supplies. That is what is a motor unit. So a single axon and the number of muscle fibers it supplies. So we know that a muscle gets a nerve supply and then if you break this up, you'll find that even a nerve, just as we looked at muscle, so I'm going to remove this. So remember when we looked at a muscle, if this was a muscle, remember the muscle was made up of muscle bundles and each bundle then had individual muscle fibers, right? You remember that? Same way, and then this muscle was supplied by a nerve, okay? And we said that skeletal muscle is supplied by the somatic nervous system. Now, if you look at this nerve, the nerve in turn is actually made up of number of fibers, which are called nerve fibers or axons. And the muscle was made up of number of muscle fibers, right? So this was a muscle fiber, here's another muscle fiber, here's another. So when one of these nerve fibers comes to supply muscle fibers, that is known as a motor unit. Have you followed? So just like a muscle, a nerve is also made up of number of threads or, or nerve fibers. And a single one of those supplies a number of muscle fibers. So it could be three, it could be four, it could be five. So some muscles which are small have small motor units. That means one nerve fiber will supply only few muscle fibers. But muscles which are really large, like your gluteus maximus, the one that forms your bottom region, that has large motor units. That means one nerve fiber may supply 20, 30 or even 40 muscle fibers. Okay. So that's a motor unit. So now let's look here. So you can see here. So this is kind of showing you a motor unit, single nerve fiber and the muscle fibers that it innervates. So when this nerve fiber comes towards a muscle fiber, so we are looking at just that portion. When this nerve fiber comes towards the muscle fiber, it dilates at its end. That dilated part is known as the axon terminal. So the dilated portion is known as the axon terminal. The dilated portion of that nerve is known as the axon terminal, which is what is shown over here. So 
and the point where this axon meets the nerve uh, the muscle fiber that point is known as the neuromuscular junction that point is called the neuromuscular junction if you think of it neuro for the nerve fiber muscular for the muscle fiber so here we are looking at one neuromuscular junction so look here at one neuromuscular junction so it is formed by the axon terminal which is the nerve part of it and the muscle part of it will be the sarcolemma right but where the nerve fiber comes close to the sarcolemma if you notice the sarcolemma actually becomes folded like this see this the sarcolemma is folded and this folded part of the sarcolemma is known as the motor end plate so this folded part is known as the motor end plate so your neuromuscular junction is between the axon terminal so it's between the axon terminal which is the neuro part of it and between the motor end plate which is the muscle part of it followed okay so let's see what happens here so here is the axon terminal in this folded part of the sarcolemma also called the motor end plate you have receptors which are present here okay in skeletal muscle these receptors are known as acetylcholine receptors so these receptors are known as acetylcholine receptors i don't see the word uh, written here ach stands for acetylcholine so it's acetylcholine receptors so right in the beginning when we were doing unit 1 we talked of receptors present on various uh, cell surfaces so here you can see the importance of those receptors so these are their receptors are very specific so if you have a receptor for acetylcholine it will attach to acetylcholine if you have a receptor for adrenaline it will attach to adrenaline so you know different receptors atta attach to different um, substances so let's see what happens so a nerve impulse comes along traveling from the central nervous system it comes down the nerve it comes down the nerve fiber and it comes towards this axon terminal as this nerve impulse comes calcium ions now these are different calcium ions they have nothing to do with the calcium which is present inside the muscle this is we are talking about the nerve so surrounding the nerve terminal also on the outside we have calcium ions they enter into the axon terminal and what they do is inside the axon terminal you can see you have these little vesicles if you remember when we did uh, cell organelles a vesicle is just a round structure which contains something inside it so these little vesicles they contain a neurotransmitter that means neurotransmitter is something which allows the nerve impulse to pass across so they contain a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine so they contain acetylcholine these vesicles are known as synaptic vesicles why synaptic because where this axon terminal meets the motor end plate you can see there is a space between them there is no cell to cell continuity it isn't as if this axon terminal is stuck to the motor end plate can you see that there is a gap between them that gap is known as the synaptic cleft the word cleft means a gap okay so that gap is called the synaptic cleft or synaptic space so these vesicles because they are whatever they have will be liberated into the synaptic cleft these vesicles are therefore called synaptic vesicles and they contain acetylcholine you can see in the axon terminal you have these things represent mitochondria because they you need mitochondria to produce energy so when the nerve impulse arrives and travels all the way down the nerve it comes right up to the axon terminal and that causes calcium from the outside to enter into the axon terminal here the calcium causes the synaptic vesicles to go towards the bottom of the axon terminal and it causes them to fuse with this cell membrane and liberate their acetylcholine that acetylcholine is liberated into the synaptic cleft yes the calcium causes these synaptic vesicles to travel you can see they are just sort of hanging loosely over there but when the 
uh, nerve impulse arrives it causes calcium to move inside the axon terminal which causes these synaptic vesicles to travel downwards towards the lower part of this cell membrane of the axon terminal and you can see they are fusing with this and by exocytosis they pour their secretions which is acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft okay now the acetylcholine is lying in the synaptic cleft this acetylcholine will attach to these re receptors which are present on the motor end plate so once it attaches and binds to these receptors on the motor end plate it will stimulate the motor end plate or the sarcolemma right followed so that was the purpose of having acetylcholine that was the purpose of having these acetylcholine receptors so we are not still done with what happens with the nerve impulse now after some time you do not want this motor end plate to keep on getting stimulated because if acetylcholine keeps traveling down and it keeps kind of stimulating this motor end plate the muscle will go on contracting right so at some point the acetylcholine needs to be removed it is removed by a special enzyme which is present here in the synaptic cleft that enzyme is known as acetylcholine esterase okay so acetylcholine esterase is an enzyme which removes acetylcholine So let's look at this neuromuscular junction. An action potential arrives at the presynaptic terminal causing voltage gated calcium ion channels to open, increasing the calcium ion permeability of the presynaptic terminal cell membrane. Calcium ions enter the presynaptic terminal and vesicle neuro acetylcholine from the synaptic vessel into the presynaptic cleft. Diffusion of acetylcholine across the synaptic cleft and acetylcholine to acetylcholine receptors on the postsynaptic muscle fiber membrane causes an in the permeability of ligand-gated sodium ion channels. The movement of sodium ions into the muscle cells in deviation of the peptic membrane. Once in reach, postsynaptic action potential is generated and is propagated over the muscle cell membrane. Choline is acetic and choline to cleft by the enzyme acetylcholine esterase. The choline is reabsorbed by the presynaptic terminal and combined with acetic acid to form choline, which is the synaptic vesicles. So I only showed you a little part, little further. You saw how it bound to the acetylcholine receptor, sodium ions to go in, right? So that's what we are going to see next. So first, let's do a few questions. What is released into the synaptic cleft to bring about stimulation of the motor end plate? acetylcholine yes not calcium ions calcium ions are not released into the cleft neither is troponin troponin is part of the muscle so it's it's not released into the so look at this calcium ions are released here into the axon terminal uh, acetylcholine was the one which was released into the cleft and what was the other choice i had um not acetylcholine ester acetylcholine esterase is present there but that's not the one which brings about stimulation of the motor end plate so that's why you have to read the question carefully okay okay so here this one the neuromuscular junction is between the axon terminal and the motor end plate of the muscle fiber is that true or false
This is true. This is why you have you must look at your PowerPoint slides really, really carefully. Because look at this motor end plate and look at this axon terminal of the neuromuscular junction sarcolemma of the muscle fiber right and the sarcolemma is called the motor end plate so it is between the axon terminal and the motor end plate okay this is the neuromuscular junction pardon okay you're saying that it's called the sarcolemma this this is the sarcolemma this folded part of the sarcolemma is called the motor end plate see motor end plate is the folded region of sarcolemma here at the neuromuscular junction no no this this is the same thing this is sarcolemma and this is this part is muscle see sarcoplasm of muscle fiber and this is the sarcolemma which is which covers the muscle fiber and here is the axon and in between them is the synaptic cleft. And in that video you saw he mentioned presynaptic and postsynaptic. Just in case it, it tr troubled you. Pre means before, post means after. So presynaptic is the axon terminal because it's before the synapse. The motor end plate and muscle is after the synapse. So that's why it's called postsynaptic. Okay. Okay, let's look at this one. What is the trigger for release of acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft? They should read acetylcholine. There should be no C over there. But. The end, yes, the entry of calcium ions into the axon terminal. And again, it's very, very important. Look at this. This removal of blocking action of tropomyosin. <coughs> tropomyosin is something present inside the muscle. Here I'm asking about acetylcholine, which is part of the neuron or the nerve fiber. So it has nothing to do with the muscle at this point here. Cross bridges, again, that's something to do with the muscle. And acetylcholine esterase, that acts, does not react with the synaptic vesicles, it reacts with acetylcholine. And again, if you look at this picture, this is why looking at the slides is really important in reading everything in the slides. And you look here, see this, calcium ch uh, channels open, calcium enters the axon terminal, its entry causes acetylcholine to be released. So see this, all the, the answers are really given in your slide itself, okay? And you can see this happen. So please do look at your um, slides very, very carefully. So let's see. So now we are going to do what that video showed. So your acetylcholine was released into the synaptic cleft. It bound to the acetylcholine receptors. And what it does is it causes depolarization. And what happens in depolarization is that, this, remember I said the sodium ions were more on the outside, potassium was more on the inside. So now what it does is it causes these sodium channels to open. Normally those channels are closed and sodium always remains on the outside. Potassium remains on the inside of the muscle cell. But after the arrival of the nerve impulse with acetylcholine binding to the acetylcholine receptors on the motor end plate, that changes, that cause, the changes the configuration of the muscle cell membrane. So it opens up these sodium ions, so sodium begins to go in. When it begins to go in now, positive charges are more on the inside. Get it? That is known as depolarization. And that sets about what is known as an action potential. So the action potential goes in either direction. After some time, the muscle now, as it keeps progressing, so one patch gets depolarized. So if we go here. So one patch, say this area gets depolarized, then it, you can see over here, this patch is still as remaining normal. So if you look here, look at this patch, this is the area which is depolarized. This is the same as a resting membrane potential because you have more sodium on the outside and put less 
uh, more potassium on the inside, the inside being less positively charged. So here what happens is this patch gets depolarized and it sends the action potential in either direction. As it does that, and now this will start getting depolarized, this has to come back to normal so that it can get ready for the next nerve impulse, okay? So that process when it tries to come back to normal is known as repolarizing. That means restoring the sarcolemma to its initial polarized state where it's negative inside and positive outside. So how that happens is now put the sodium channels close, so no more sodium is allowed inside and the potassium channels open. So now potassium begins to leave quickly because, you know, there was more inside anyway. So it leaves quickly. So when positive charges go out, what happens? You get more potassium now on the outside and sodium was closed. So you had these sodium ions trapped inside. Okay. So this is called repolarization. During this period when the muscle is set, undergoing this coming back to normal, it is said to be in what is known as a refractory state. Sorry. That means it can, cannot, till it comes back to normal, it cannot receive another nerve impulse. The word refractory means that during the process of repolarization, when it's trying to come back to its original state, it cannot receive another nerve impulse. Now what happens here is, so we've, we've brought sodium inside and we've trapped it inside and now we throw <coughs> potassium outside. So we've kind of restored the ionic balance. So there are more positive charges on the outside, less on the inside, okay? But however, can you see that an opposite thing has happened? Normally it was sodium which was more outside and it was potassium which was more inside, right? So we have to make the ionic balance come back to normal too. That's why we have those sodium-potassium pumps. If you remember when we did active transport, when we were doing that, we talked of sodium-potassium pumps. This is where those sodium-potassium pumps become important. So while this voltage difference has been brought to normal, the sodium-potassium pumps which are present, what they do is they actually they'll throw the potassium back in and take the sodium out. So then they restore the ionic balance. Okay, so now sodium goes outside and potassium comes back inside. So that is the purpose of the sodium-potassium pumps. Okay, so this is known as repolarization. So now we did two things. So first is we talked about sliding of the filaments. That was the first thing we talked about, how the myosin heads kind of bound to actin and they pulled it towards the center and they slid and the sarcomere shortened and that was sliding and that was what contra caused contraction. And then we asked a question, what was it that actually caused that sliding to occur? And then we saw it was arrival of the nerve impulse, right? That nerve impulse came, it stimulated the motor end plate and the action potential was generated and then the sliding occurred. So now let's bring the two together. So let's see how exactly the nerve impulse comes, how exactly it triggers the sliding to occur. So when we put the two things together, we call it excitation, contraction, coupling. And as the name suggests, excitation is excitation of the muscle fiber by arrival of the nerve stimulus at the neuromuscular junction. The contraction is this part where actin and myosin bind to each other and they slide past each other. And here we are going to see what happens in how we kind of relate these two together. So we talked, here we talked, of, we talked about excitation of the muscle fiber by arrival of a nerve impulse at the neuromuscular junction. That caused acetylcholine to be released and bound to the receptors at the motor end plate. That caused depolarization and it causes spread of the action potential. So we only talk till that part, right? And then here, remember those T-tubules, I told you those T-tubules were invaginations of the sarcolemma. So here if you have, this is the motor end plate like this. And if you come down here, here's an invagination which is called a T-tubule. So as the action potential spreads, it spreads along this way, it will also go into the T-tubule. So it will stimulate the T-tubules. And if you remember in that picture, you saw that terminal cisternae were lying on either side of the T-tubules. 
So what happens is that as this action potential passes into the T tubules, it stimulates the terminal cisterni. They then liberate their calcium ions and when they liberate calcium ions, that binds to troponin, really, you know, makes the active sites free, <laughs> unblocks the uh, blocking action of tropomyosin. When the active sites are free, myosin can bind to actin and sliding occurs. Can you see that? So that's what constitutes excitation, contraction, coupling. Okay? So let's look at this now. And this is a picture which shows you that. So here is the neuromuscular junction. So here you can see the action potential has arrived. Acetylcholine has come into the synaptic cleft, bound to the receptors. So it depolarization happens. It generates an action potential which travels in either direction. As you can see these arrows. As it's traveling in either direction, it travels and here it finds this T tubules, that invagination. So it passes down the T tubules. So here it will stimulate these terminal cisterni. So here you can see how the T tubules are being stimulated and they in turn stimulate the terminal cisterni which release calcium ions. Their function was to store and release calcium ions when, when needed. When they release calcium ions, that binds to troponin and changes the configuration of the actin filament. So now the active sites are exposed. The myosin head uses ATP and binds to the actin filament and pulls it to the center. And that's how the entire muscle contracts. Got that? So you cannot have one and not have the other. So if there is no nerve supply, there will be no contraction. If there is a nerve supply but the muscle for some reason is damaged, let's say it's all scar tissue, it is completely damaged, the nerve supply may come as may keep coming, but there's nothing to stimulate. So that won't happen. So can you see both have to be working together? Okay? So let's put the two together and see this. The twelve steps to muscle contraction. Step one. Neuron action potential arrives at the end of motor neuron. Sodium ions rush into muscle fibers. Step 5. Muscle action potential swifting tubules. Step 6. Muscle myosin binding sites. Step 9. Myosin binds to actin. Step 10. Pivot actin filament. Step 11. Myosin releases from actin. Step 12. Myosin re-extends into ready position. So that showed you both things occurring together, okay? So there was excitation by the nerve impulse 
which triggered calcium release within the muscle cell, the muscle fiber, and caused the binding of myosin and actin, which was a contraction part of it. Okay, so that's how you have excitation, contraction, and they're coupled together. Any questions on this part? It is a lot, but if you kind of break it down into steps and see everything that we did had a function. See, we talked of T-tubules in the beginning, which were invaginations of the sarcolemma. What was their function? That was Their function was to transmit this nerve impulse down here, and then they helped to stimulate the terminal cisterni, which were lying close to them. That's the reason why the terminal cisterni were close to them, so that they could stimulate them, cause release of calcium ions, and help actin and myosin bind. So here you can see calcium has two functions. Inside the muscle, it causes tropomyosin. It prevents uh, or it unblocks that tropomyosin binding. Uh, you know, it unblocks the bind. Uh, let me say this again. It unblocks the blocking action of tropomyosin, right, by binding to troponin. And inside the axon, what it does is it causes a synaptic vesicles to release acetylcholine. So can you see how calcium is so important in our body? So far you did it in, in um, skeletal system, how it was important for bone, right? But now can you see even for muscle and nerve uh, contraction, muscle contraction and nerve stimulus, calcium is important, okay? I have a question. Yeah. In the video, it showed the green balls coming in. Mm-hmm to, um, I'm assuming it was the sodium channel. Right, right. And then it had little pink well, I think at that point, what it was trying to show is at one point, actually, it should be have been separate. The one point, the sodium ions come in, potassium re remains inside. Second part of it, when repolarization occurs, the sodium is stopped, the, it's closed, potassium goes out. So I don't know what the other ions were, the, were going, yeah, yeah. Okay, now look at this question. What would happen if a substance such as curare was bound irreversibly to the acetylcholine receptors at the motor end plates? I don't know if you, how many of you read Phantom Comics, or maybe you're too young to read them. But, um, you know, they, they have these things which kind of are muscle sort of blockers. They block muscle action. So these, uh, so they used to shoot, uh, you know, the pygmy tribe, they used to shoot these arrows which were tipped with curare and they would cause paralysis of a person. So, yeah. so think of it. So I'm giving you this thing that what happens if, think of it that curare is there and it has gone and bound to the acetylcholine receptors at the motor end plate. So imagine if you were used to sitting at a particular seat and somebody came and sat on your seat, so I'm giving you, that's the you know, analogy I'm giving you. So I want to see if you've understood what's happening. Very good, yes. The nerve impulse would be normal, but there would be no muscle contraction. And for those who did not get this, it's like this. So here is the motor end plate, uh, sorry, the um, axon terminal. And here is the motor end plate. And here are those receptors. So just as the example, imagine you have, you're going for an exam and you've got a seat in the exam. And someone comes and sits in your seat. What happens? You can't take the exam, right? So like that. So you have something which is already sitting on these acetylcholine receptors. So this is releasing acetylcholine. The synaptic vesicles release acetylcholine. So the nerve impulse comes. It helps to release acetylcholine. But now this cannot bind to the receptor. So no depolarization, no generation of action potential. So the muscle will not be able to contract, right? But this would be okay. So that's why this was the correct answer. So this is what is critical thinking. So you might get a couple of questions like this. 
Okay, so let's here look at types of muscle contraction. So isotonic and isometric are basically two types and then eccentric is a kind of isotonic contraction. So isotonic contraction is where the muscle contracts and it shortens as well. So it produces a movement. It shortens and produces a movement. Isometric is where the muscle contracts. There's no shortening, so there's no movement produced. But the tension inside the muscle will keep increasing. An eccentric action is where the muscle is contracting and it actually lengthens during the period of contraction. And I, in your notes, I've given you an example and I want you to do this. So put your hand on your shoulder and uh, along this contour of your shoulders where you have the deltoid muscle, okay? So now if you abduct your arm, so you're lifting it to the side of the body, can you feel your deltoid contracting? It has shortened, that's why this muscle has been, this action has been produced of abduction. Now keep your arm by the, by like this. Feel the muscle, it's still contracting, right? But there's no movement. Okay, so from, from this neutral position to the abducted position, this is isotonic. The muscle shortened and produced movement. Now when you keep it in this position, can you see the muscle is still contracting? You can feel the tension in the muscle, but there's no movement produced, right? This is known as isometric contraction. And then if slowly you bring this, your hand down to the side, slowly, can you see there is still tension in the muscle, but the muscle is lengthening and after some time that tension gives way, right? So that is uh, eccentric action, okay? And this is why when you go to the gym, it is good to, when you perform movements, instead of doing them really fast, if you do them slowly, you're actually using all three of these types of muscle contraction and that helps a muscle a lot because you help to, uh, you know, you're doing, when you're doing resistance training, okay? So let's look at some muscle facts. One is when you touch any muscle, even though it's not producing any movement or anything, you can feel there's a certain tenseness in it, right? That is what is called muscle tone. Our muscles are not flabby. You can feel they kind of seem to be a little bit contracted. There's some amount of tension in them. That tension is known as muscle tone. So all muscles have a tone. When it loses its nerve supply, that tone disappears. And that's when muscles feel flabby or what is known as flaccid. When it loses its nerve supply, it becomes flaccid or flabby. When would that happen? Well, if, if imagine you have an injury and the nerve, uh, and you damage a nerve and that nerve is supplying a particular muscle, that muscle will become flabby. Okay? And if you don't use that muscle, that muscle will actually begin to die. That is known, that is known as atrophy. The word atrophy when it is when a muscle begins, any atrophy is when a structure dies. So when a muscle begins to die, that's known as atrophy. In the case of muscles, we use the term disuse atrophy. Because remember I said you need both the nerve and the muscle to be intact in order for action to occur, right? So here if you have cut off the nerve, so here look at this, if you cut off this nerve, the muscle is fine, but there's no nerve supply going to it, right? So it cannot act. So you cannot use the muscle. Since you can't use the muscle, it starts getting weaker and weaker because the sarcoplasm slowly diminishes, the connective tissue diminishes, the muscle becomes really small. So in muscles, we call it disuse atrophy. So how do we prevent disuse atrophy? That's why people who have had injury, it so happens that in the peripheral nervous system, nerves can regenerate. So till you're waiting for the nerve to regenerate, they undergo physiotherapy. So in physiotherapy, what you're doing is you're artificially stimulating the muscle and you're passively kind of moving it so that it doesn't undergo disuse atrophy. That's why physiotherapy is really, really important. I already talked about motor unit. I told you motor unit was a motor neuron or an axon and the number of muscle fibers it supplies. So here you can see, see this is a nerve, look at this, this is a nerve and it's, it, he's only showing you two fibers in the nerve, one is red and one is 
kind of purplish in color, but there are many more, so there could be more coming out like this, okay, in different colors. But you can see this red one is going to, is stimulating this fiber, this fiber, and this. So it's stimulating three fibers. Look at the purple one, stimulating this and this. So this motor unit has three muscle fibers. This motor unit has two muscle fibers. So you can see that there'll be many motor units inside a muscle. The bigger the muscle, the more the motor units. The smaller the muscle, fewer motor units, okay? Bulky muscle and strength are correlated. They're directly proportional. The more, the bulkier a muscle is, that means the larger a muscle is, automatically it becomes more powerful, right? You have more muscle fibers in it, so obviously they can generate more power. Smaller muscles are less powerful. Earlier I talked about stretching a muscle. I remember I told you that stretching a muscle contracts to about two-thirds of its resting length. So imagine if a muscle's length, say this is a normal length of a muscle, okay? And what does what is contraction brought about by? It's brought about by these myosin filaments pulling on the actin filaments, right? So they pull on the actin filaments. So when you stretch a muscle, what you do is you pull the actin further away. So the overlap is a little less than it was before here. So therefore, it can pull even more towards the center. Can you see? So that is the purpose of stretching. So when you stretch, you make these cross bridges go further away. You do not want to stretch so much that they are completely away because then this myosin cannot attach to anything, isn't it? It needs something to attach to. So that's why stretching to a certain extent, when they stretch too far, then it's, it becomes a problem. And when a muscle is really short, so suppose, for example, a muscle is kind of relaxed and really short, the contraction will not be as, as much because it's got only so much in which to overlap, okay? Atrophy, I told you, where a muscle kind of dies or, you know, becomes less bulky, loses sarcoplasm, all of that. Hypertrophy is the opposite. The word hyper means too much. So hypertrophy is when there is an increase in size of muscle fiber. And then obviously the overall the muscle. So atrophy will be decrease in size. In our body, muscles hypertrophy. So when you go and work out in the gym, you, what you're really doing, and your muscle becomes bulky, what you're really doing is you're making each individual muscle fiber become larger. So this becomes, instead of this, the diameter increases because it gets more sarcoplasm, increased connective tissue, more blood supply, so that's what it does. So in your body, you do not increase the number of muscle fibers, you only increase the size of each individual muscle fiber, okay? So that is known as hypertrophy, that means increasing in size. The word, you have another word which is called hyperplasia, which you may want to note down. Hyperplasia is when there is increase in the number of muscle fibers. So increase in the number of muscle fibers. That does not occur normally, as I said, in all of your muscles. So when you're going to the gym, all you're doing when your muscle gets bulky, you're only increasing the size of each individual muscle fiber, so the overall muscle looks big. There's no increase in the number of fibers. So let's say your biceps had 100 muscle fibers, it'll still have 100, but just that the diameter of each of those would have increased. Hyperplasia, which is increase in the number of muscle fibers, only occurs physiologically in the uterus in our body. And the uterus is an organ, so it's made of smooth muscle. So in a pregnant uterus, not only does each muscle hyper, each muscle fiber hypertrophy, that means there is increase in size, but there's also increase in number of muscle fibers, which is why when the, after a baby is born, the uterus comes, you know, becomes smaller, but it never comes back to its original size because it has increased the number of fibers. So if it started out with 100, it would probably end up with, say, 150, and then they, the size decreases in each one of them. Yes, you had a question? Yeah. Hypertrophy is increase in the size of muscle fibers. Hyper, hyperplasia is increase in number of muscle fibers. 
So in uh, hypertrophy, its size, you still remain with four. But if each one was measuring one millimeter in diameter, each one now becomes two. Hyperplasia, you began with four, but you ended up with six. Okay, that's the difference. And hyperplasia does not occur. Does not occur in, uh, normally in other in in your um, muscle cells. It will if there's a tumor or something that's different. But physiologically, only occurs in the uterus. But I mean, does it reverse ever? Hyperplasia? Yeah. No. So once you have no. Increased no. In the in the uterus, no. It no, you always have it. Yeah. <clears throat> Let's look at phases of muscle contraction and see what when you know when you sort of take up, if you go in the lab and you can do a twitch, you have, you do a muscle twitch, you have three phases of muscle contraction. These are called latent period, that means nothing is happening, nothing that you can observe visually is happening, but actually something is happening inside. This is where that excitation, contraction, coupling action occurs and the cross bridges are beginning to form. So that's the latent period. In the period of contraction is when the sliding actually occurs. And relaxation is when the calcium returns to the terminal cisterny and, you know, the, the fiber comes back to its original state. Now, there are two ways that you can cause muscles to act and, you know, perform a powerful movement. One is we said that, you know, a nerve impulse arrives and causes a muscle to contract. Now, if... And it's not that a muscle contracts because only one nerve impulse arrives. Nerve impulses kind of arrive in succession. So one arrives, it causes depolarization and goes so on. Then the next one arrives again, you know, the thing keeps going on. So if you increase the speed at which these nerve impulses arrive, that is no, that what it will do is that the muscle will contract. And just before it begins to relax, it will contract again because at this point, more calcium ions are present. There's heat generated. So the contraction becomes a little bit stronger. So this kind of produces a wave like you see here. So the word summation means to add up. So wave is the waves are being added up. So this wave summation is because the frequency of stimuli is increased. So they kind of appear uh, arriving very, very rapidly. Sometimes when they arrive so fast that they are not allowed to relax. So you might get a... So they, this here, you can see very little relaxation is occurring. Sometimes it may be so much that they don't relax at all and they kind of become absolutely fused at the top. That is known as, that thing is known as tetanus, okay, where the contractions are totally fused, so the muscle does not relax at all. This, the example given in your book is really good. It's something like, imagine you're trying to lift a huge car or something so weighty that you push with all your strength so then your you know the the contraction is kind of absolutely fused at the top and so it doesn't occur very often in us the other one is motor unit recruitment so you remember i said a muscle has many motor units and i've always made the statement that the body is very very economical it tends to kind of use only as much as it needs so imagine if you had to pick up a little, let's say like this mouse of mine, with, and I use my biceps muscle to flex at the elbow and pick up this mouse. It's, it's not very weighty, so I don't need to stimulate all my motor units in my biceps, so some of them get stimulated and I'm able to pick up this, okay? So the muscle, the power generated by the muscle is not much. Let's say now I, I need to pick up my laptop, which is much heavier than the mouse. So now more motor, because I need more power, so I have to stimulate more motor units and hence it will be, more, the action would be more powerful. So here it is what is called, you're calling more motor units into play. So the word used is recruitment. So you recruit more u motor units and this is when the strength of the stimulus is increased. In the lab it will be, you know, we, we will give a stimulus of one volt and you'll find the response to be something. Then we increase the stimulus to three volts, the response will be even higher. In real life, it is like this. So the stimulus is just lifting up the mouse, only a few motor units, and you know, the power generated is X. I lift a laptop, more motor units, so the power generated will be X plus 10 or something. And let's say I want to lift this whole table, all the motor units in my muscle will be recruited or will be called into play and I may or may not be able to lift the 
the table, but they'll all be called into play and I'll try to lift that. So the, the more motor units you recruit, the more powerful the action will be, right? So it's like someone were to give you a slap on your face, just a few motor units, and they're going to give you a really hard whack, more motor units, right? So this is just showing you a muscle twitch. So this air, this part is the latent period where that excitation contraction is occurring. This is where the contraction actually occurs. So this is where the sliding is happening. And this is the period of relaxation where the calcium goes back to the terminal cisterny. And this was what I was talking about, uh, you know, when wave summation. So you can see these waves are kind of being added up. So when you kind of stimulate a muscle during it, the time when it's relaxing because more calcium ions and heat and everything is available, it, the next uh, contraction would be more powerful, the next one even more and so on. And when it absolutely fuses, you get what is called complete tetanus. And this is different from, you know, the tetanus vaccine that you take for the bacterial infection. That is, that's a different thing. That's a bacterial infection. Okay. Yes. Is not seen normally in your body very often. It's no. also irreversible. Yes. Uh, no, it is not irreversible. You can, uh, yeah, you can, yeah, you can. No, the complete tetanus is because the stimuli are appearing, uh, are, are hitting the muscle so fast and so quick, it's not allowed to relax at all. So like I said, you, when you lift, trying to lift a really heavy object, you know, the muscle is contracted. It's not relaxing in between. That's what it is. Yeah, it stays in a contracted position. Okay. So what is an example of um, tetanus happening? I, I gave an example that when you try to lift a really, really heavy object, like some superhuman effort, you want to lift a car or something like that. That is when it's going to be. It's so it doesn't like occur that. very often in, in your body. But would that cause? Fused tetanus. Use? Fused tetanus. That's what it would cause. Yeah. Okay. About yes, in that the muscle, it's tetanus, fused tetanus is not an irreversible thing. It will relax, okay, it will come back. Right. Yeah, yeah. Let's look at muscle metabolism. So this is how we talked about how ATP was important, right? So here, let's see how is ATP generated for the use for use by the muscle. Remember how the uh, myosin needed ATP? So there are three ways that we use ATP. In your body, you actually, in your muscles, you have ATP which is already stored. So if you have to do something very quickly, like about three to four seconds, that ATP is used up. But let's say you have to go beyond that for 10 or 15 seconds. You have inside your muscles, you have a high energy molecule, which is known as creatine phosphate. So this creatine phosphate is a high energy molecule and what it does is it gives up its phosphate ion to ADP and forms ATP. Okay, so that's how ATP is generated and then this ATP is used by the myosin filaments to do that cross-linking. So when is this, you don't use any oxygen, when is this kind of method used to produce ATP when, like I said, you want to do something short for 10 or 15 seconds. So one example is like maybe a short sprint. You know, you've seen in the Olympics when people run the 100 meter sprint, they do it in eight seconds or, you know, I don't know what the current um, record is, but something like that. OK, so this is when you would use um, this kind of method, which is known as direct phosphor phosphorylation or use of creatine phosphate. Let's say you want to do something for a little bit longer, like maybe you want to run a 300 meter sprint and somebody who, who is kind of trained and would run it within 40, 50 seconds or you're playing a tennis game which lasts only about a minute maximum, you know, between 50 seconds to a minute. So at that time you want ATP to be generated really fast so that it gives you energy to play that game. So this method used here is, uh, is known as anaerobic pathway or also known as anaerobic glycolysis where again no oxygen is used the energy source is glucose so glucose is broken down this happens really fast and it for each molecule of glucose you get two ATP molecules so 
you can use that atp and produce whatever and do whatever you want but obviously this is is something that is going to kind of if you want to do it for longer periods you can't rely on this because you're only producing two atp molecules right so you have to keep breaking down glucose and the other disadvantage to this is that you end up with lactic acid which is a by product and that can build up in the blood and cause a uh, soreness and cause fatigue okay so you don't want this to happen either so this is done like i said for activities which at the maximum may be a minute so between about 40 to 50 seconds or maybe a minute so you know something like a longer sprint maybe 30 300 uh, meter sprint or like a short tennis game just a game of tennis which lasts about that time the third pathway is where you use oxygen so this is known as the aerobic pathway remember the mitochondria are the ones which use oxygen and produce this this is slow but it generates a lot of atp so it generates actually 32 molecules of atp you can see and the energy using oxygen is through the like uh, this glucose breakdown this pyruvic acid or you can get it from fatty acids and amino acids also so either one of them can be can go into the mitochondria break them down produce carbon dioxide and water and produce atp so this kind of activity it's slow to start but when it does get in to play it produces lot of atp so it allows you to continue the activity for a long time so for sustained activity okay so this is as in a marathon for example you're running a long long thing you know maybe about a few hours so that's when you want constant generation and you don't want anything to happen really you're not interested in happening really fast you because it's a sustained kind of activity that's when you use this aerobic pathway and no there are no by products over here okay so um i think we'll stop here so we discussed the ways the body uses to make atp and you know for which period of activity which process is used so let's look at these processes let's look at some videos on these processes so the first one is creatine phosphate which is used for short bursts of activity program If you've ever wondered how creatine really works, you've come to the right place. Creatine helps to build lean mass and burst power output. But what is creatine? In food. It's like beef, chicken, and fish. Creatine is even produced in body, the liver. It drives burst muscle and ATP. molecules with strongly bound phosphates when a phosphate breaks loose energy is released creatine's job is to replenish the phosphates to keep atp running supplement creatine sheer volume of a fuel to power now let's look inside a muscle fiber to see exactly how this works muscle fibers are completely short segments of sarcomere Sarcomere contains contractile proteins called actin and myosin. The signal to contract starts with an impulse from the nervous system. Energy released from ATP powers each cycle of contractions. This is why more available protein supports greater muscle power output and explosive strength. Let's review supplementing with So you saw how creatine helps with short bursts of um, power and your body actually stores enough atp to do about 4 seconds of activity and after that you know creatine is the one which is going to provide it if your activity is a little bit longer then you have to do the anaerobic pathway so let's take a look at this
So you're going to read it because there's no audio with this. So this is why in this pathway, remember I said one of the byproducts was lactic acid because I, as it showed very nicely over there, pyruvic acid is produced and you'll see the same pyruvic acid is the one which goes into the aerobic pathway. But if it's produced faster than it can be utilized, it gets broken down into lactic acid and that lactic acid builds up and causes fatigue and you know soreness, so you can't use that. So that's why you use this pathway only for like short activities, which is about, you know, maximum to a minute. Now, if you wanted some slow, sustained activity, that's when you'll use the aerobic pathway, which gets the pyruvic acid from glycolysis, the initial breakdown. Or you could even use fatty acids and amino acids to go into this pathway. So let's look at the aerobic pathway. This is the most complex of the three energy systems required as the heart, lungs, and whole circulatory system to work. Arts of intense physical activity, the system becomes the main source. It is at this point large quantities of oxygen carried by the blood becomes available to the muscles. Presence of large stores of glycogen in the body, which is synthesized into ATP and products, which the muscle cells expel via the blood. This expulsion of the waste products prevents muscles from becoming fatigued for a short period of time. The heart lungs work greater oxygenated blood around them. Aerobic energy allows the muscles to keep on working and working. As well as using glycogen as the basis for ATP, the system is the body. However, this requires large amounts of oxygen. So for moderate to intense physical activity, glycogen is the preferred source of ATP. To active stuff. That takes over the synthesis. Marathon runners, they can detect when this occurs in the body and refer to reaching that point as hitting the wall. Most greater amounts of that is available to an athlete must rest or slow down. In extreme events such as famine, body fat can also become totally used up and protein the aerobic system requires heart and central 
respiratory system to oxygen to muscles. Glycolysis synthesizes ATP from glycogen. Water and CO2 cells blood flow. System becomes the dominant energy under 30 seconds of activity and can sustain around two hours of continuity. After this point, fat becomes the main source of ATP synthesis. For any whenever you want to do that, you do anaerobic. You can't work out for too long. If you so that's why strength. You know, the, the first time you go to the gym, you work out only for a short time. You're slowly kind of building up your um, oxygen supply, your blood flow to those uh, to you know to your muscles, and that's why after maybe a few months, you find you can do it for a much longer period, and that's why you know walking for a very very long time, not just like a quick walk is not going to help you lose that much weight as is when you kind of do something like this. You know, you don't have to run a marathon, but, you know, for go for long walks, um, use up as much of your glycogen stores as possible, and then, you know, fat and proteins, which is what is shown up here. Okay. This is a very nice picture which I've taken from your book. So you can see for short duration exercises, just like I said, ATP is stored in your muscle. So you have enough for about four to five seconds, six is about the maximum. So the first uh, bit of exercise that you do when you actually begin, it's the stored ATP in the muscle which is used up and then you take another 10 seconds and that's from the creatine phosphate. After that you continue for a little longer, you know, 40 seconds to a minute, that's when aerobic, uh, I mean anaerobic glycolysis occurs and then when you want prolonged duration exercise like a marathon, then you use um, the aerobic pathway, you know. Here we're going to look at types of muscle fibers based on how fast they um, contract and how fast they generate ATP. So the names itself kind of tell you that. So this is called slow oxidative. So slow, it hydrolyzes ATP slowly. Oxidative means it uses oxygen or the aerobic pathway. Okay, so these are also known as slow twitch muscles. And in our body, our muscles are basically made up of all three types. There are three types over here. This is the first type, slow oxidative. They are made, they are a mix of the three types of fibers. We have a predominance of one based on what our activity is. But uh, most of us have about half of them being slow oxidative. But someone who is a marathon runner, you can understand, has to have muscle which is going to use the aerobic pathway, which does not fatigue easily. So they are going to have more of the slow oxidative fi uh, fibers. Anybody who does very quick action will not need the slow oxidative. They'll have, you know, another kind of fiber which we'll see. So let's look at some properties of the slow oxidative pathway. This hydrolyzes ATP slowly. That's why it's called slow. Remember, the aerobic pathway was slow to start, but when it did start, it produced a lot of ATP. So it uses oxygen. That's why it's called oxidative. Hence, it will have a lot of mitochondria in it because mitochondria is the area where aerobic pathway occurs. And these fibers also have a pigment called myoglobin. I seem to remember having mentioned myoglobin earlier. Myoglobin is very similar to the pigment found in red blood cells called hemoglobin. And hemoglobin pigment binds to oxygen. And that's what gives the red color to blood. The red blood cells are the maximum number of cells in blood. So that's what gives the blood its color. So here this myoglobin is very similar to um, hemoglobin. And this gives muscle its red color because of its capacity to bind with oxygen. These muscles, the slow oxidative muscles, are usually thin with small diameter. Because if you have very thick muscles, it's very difficult for the blood supply to reach the interior. You know, so it kind of thick, too much cytoplasm will compress blood vessels. So you can't get enough oxygen into the tissue. So here into the muscle fiber. So here that's why these are very thin. 
because they get a constant source of oxygen supply and they're using this they are fatigue resistant so that's why they are well suited for anything which requires you to have a sustained activity so endurance activities and marathons are the ones which require that okay hemoglobin or myoglobin no i said myoglobin is very similar to hemoglobin and hemoglobin in red blood cells gives red blood cell blood its color so myoglobin in muscle gives it its color the second type of fiber is fast oxidative glycolytic so this is kind of an intermediate because it's fast but also oxidative so it sometimes it uses the oxidative pathway and sometimes it uses which is called the glycolytic pathway so that's why we say it's an intermediate type of muscle fiber this is moderately fatigue resistant so used for you know sprinting or walking but not for very very long distances you know for short but not really short intense activity the third type of fiber are what are called fast glycolytic and these are called fast twitch so glycolytic they we use the anaerobic mechanism so they hydrolyze atp really fast if you remember the anaerobic mechanism atp was hydro, was made real quickly but you only got two right so that's why you can't sort of use it for very long which is why these muscles are fit, they fatigue easily so they are only used for short term activities and really intense activities like weight lifting or you know pitching a ball or something like that just for really short intense activities they don't have too much myoglobin in them so they are they look white in color their fibers are really large because you know think of it when you weight lift you need really bulky sort of your um, muscles of your thigh and muscles or uh, arm muscles should be really strong in order to be able to do that okay so very very large diameter they have a large quantity of glycogen because glycogen is what is broken down if you remember again from chemistry glycogen is what is broken down into glucose and in the anaerobic mechanism remember it was glucose which is broken into the pyruvic acid right and uh, during the breaking up into pyruvic acid that's when atp is released so they have large quantities of glycogen which help them to carry out these high intense activities So let's take a look at this. Okay, it looks like it's taking a while to load. Okay so it looks like that video is not working so we'll just uh Okay let's answer this question Oh okay just one second let I probably have to do it again <clears throat> okay. 
Okay, for some reason my, um, I think the, even the turning point is not working. But let's say someone who participates regularly in New York Marathon would have a preponderance of what type of fibers? So let's see, how many of you would say fast glycolytic? So I'm going to draw the thing myself. Nobody in class, okay. How many say slow oxidative? Everybody? Okay. Uh, slow oxidative, so A, B, and C. So, okay, I've got a big... How many say fast oxidative glycolysis? No one. Okay, very good. Yes, it is slow oxidative. Okay. I'm going to let everyone else <laughs> Okay, here's a good review for you guys of muscle fibers. This is something which is pres which I took from your book. So you can see, you know, like just to put everything together, their speed of contraction is slow. They oxid um, hydrolyze ATP slowly. Um, the primary mechanism is aerobic. The glycogen stores are low because they don't need, you know, they get the pyruvic acid from, um, from the anaerobic glycolysis or you can use fats and lipids. Uh, they are slow. Uh, they are fatigue resistant, and you can see endurance type activities. They are red in color, many mitochondria, and then you can look at all of these. So they are intermediate sprinting and walking, um, red to pink because they are in between. And if you look at the fast glycolytic, they use anaerobic glycolysis. They, are, they fatigue very easily, so that's why you can't use it, use these fibers for very long activities. They are white and very few mitochondria because they don't need as many because they're using the anaerobic pathway. Okay, let's see. Why are slow oxidative fibers red in color? Okay, I don't think it registered. But anyway, let's see. How many of you say they don't hydrolyze ATP fast? How many say they contain myoglobin? Okay, looks like... And how many say they have very little connective tissue? No one. Okay, looks like most of you decided this. Okay, very good. Yes, so that is... They, because they have myoglobin, which binds to oxygen, giving it that red color, that's why they are red in color, okay? Okay. 